And now, from the University of Virginia Center for Politics. Good day. My name is Damon Irby, and I'm the Director of Global Initiatives at the University of Virginia Center for Politics. Welcome to this special Ambassador Series event co-hosted by the Center for Politics Global Perspectives on Democracy program and UVA Global Affairs, and in partnership with the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies and the European Studies program. It's my pleasure to welcome the Honorable Mark Brzezinski, U.S. Ambassador to Poland, along with my colleague, Stephen Mull, who serves as UVA's Vice Provost for Global Affairs and was the U.S. Ambassador to Poland from 2012 to 2015. Following opening remarks by Ambassador Brzezinski, the two will participate in a dialogue on the latest issues impacting Poland and the U.S., with a particular focus on the war in Ukraine. The relationship between the people of, Pol of the United States and Poland began at the spring of our nation's history, when Polish national Thaddeus Kosciuszko provided aid to our country in its fight for independence. Kosciuszko and our university's founder, Thomas Jefferson, established a unique bond during his time in the U.S. Kosciuszko even willed Jefferson his U.S. holdings with the intention that the funds be used to free and educate Jefferson's slaves. Jefferson said of Kosciuszko, he is as pure a son of liberty as I have ever known. It appears that the relationship between our countries has never been stronger than today. Our economic ties, security interests, and dedication to democratic principles have drawn us closer together, especially now as we cooperate in determining how best to respond to the tragic events in Ukraine. Mark Brzezinski was sworn in as ambassador to the US, of the U.S. to Poland in December 2021 and previously served as the ambassador to Sweden from 2011 to 2015. His government service also included being the, the first executive director of the White House's Arctic Executive Steering Committee. Mark Brzezinski also served on President Clinton's National Security Council staff first as director for Russia and Eurasia, and then as director for the Balkans. He's the founder and principal of Brzezinski Strategies, LLC, and was a partner uh, at McGuire Woods, LLP. Ambassador Brzezinski received a BA from Dartmouth and a PhD from Oxford, but most importantly, he earned his Juris Doctor degree from the University of Virginia Law School. Ambassador Brzezinski will be joined in dialogue today by UVA's Vice Provost for Global Affairs, Stephen Mull. I'm sure their paths crossed from time to time between 2012 and 2015, when each served as U.S. ambassadors in Europe, Brzezinski in Sweden and Mull in Poland. Stephen Mull also served as a U.S. ambassador to Lithuania from 2003 to 2006. He was the lead coordinator for the Iran nuclear implementation from August 2015 until August 2017, and rounded out his time in the State Department as the acting undersecretary for political affairs. There are no two people better positioned for the dialogue that we are about to receive. We'll open with comments by Ambassador Brzezinski, and then move into co the conversation between him and Ambassador Moll. Some of our students have submitted questions for this event, which Ambassador Mull will share on their behalf. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome Ambassador Mark Brzezinski. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for joining us all the way from Poland. Damon, UVA Center for Politics, thank you so much for having me here today. Steve Mull, I'm, it's so great for me to see you again. I gather also that Former U.S. Ambassador to Poland, John Davis, is, is participating in this. And I was so lucky to be hosted by John and Helen Davis the first time I went to Poland when I was a UVA law student in 1990. And I just am, remain so grateful for their generosity and their support and their friendship for my family. Uh, and all I can say is, Hello, UVA. It is so great to be connected with you, albeit from afar, but I follow all the developments at UVA. I'm so proud of the UVA students and the values they espouse 
and the principles they pursue and their contribution they make to America and the world. And I can only say this from this UVA grad, Vitami, welcome, welcome to Poland. And Damon, I'm so glad you started by invoking Tadeusz Kościuszka, the Polish general who fought for American freedom during the Revolutionary War. And we can also invoke Kazimierz Pulaski and other Polish uh, officers who fought for American freedom during the Revolutionary War and since then. And that in many ways is a metaphor to the historic roots of the American Polish special friendship. It stems back centuries with each side fighting for the other's freedom. Americans over the centuries fought for Polish freedom and Poles over the centuries fought for American freedom. And it's that love of democracy and freedom that caused Poles to come to America and Americans to come to Poland. And here we are in 2023 at a time, at the first time that both countries share the same freedom. And now the organizing agenda for this special friendship between America and Poland is the crisis in Ukraine. So I look forward to discussing that with the students today and really anything else. Steve, I want to invoke your service here years ago as a political counselor, because you served here, of course, as ambassador, but also two times before that in two previous tours. And you were political counselor when the plan to expand NATO to include Poland and other Central European states was formed. And this American in Warsaw is here to report what an incredible investment that was. Because I'm speaking to you just a couple hundred miles from a war zone, because Warsaw's just a couple hundred miles from Ukraine. And I can report to you, Poland is a normal country. Children go to school, businesses are open. Poland is not anxious and uncertain. And when I came here in 1990, and when, when I was a Fulbright scholar in Poland between 1991 and 1993, and I wrote a book about the constitutional renewal underway in the country at the time, there were in some cities still Soviet troops you could hear on their morning jogs singing their songs. And Poland was more anxious and uncertain than it is today. And that is the, that is the derivative from membership in NATO that the Central Europeans gained and that it is our gain too. Because an anxious and uncertain friend is not as easy to work with and not as easy to collaborate with as a certain and confident friend. So when I go on Polish television now as US ambassador and say Polska je bezpieczna, Poland is safe. I Polska jest zabezpieczona, Poland is secure. It's because of that NATO membership. And when the Poles react in the rapid national mobilization that we have borne witness to here since the outbreak of the Ukraine crisis, it's because they also feel confident and secure. And what has that meant? Because I think one of the things that you know, US diplomats overseas want to do is to report economic efficiencies back to the American people. How, how is the load being taken off the shoulders of the American people? Well, since February 24th, 2022, Almost 10 million Ukrainians have come to Poland either to continue on to another country or ultimately to go back to Ukraine or to stay in Poland. And on February 24th, after a good deal of preparation by the US Embassy here to make sure that the eight border crossings between Poland and Ukraine, that we had a scientific understanding of those eight border crossings, and that we knew what an evacuation would look like, and that we were ready for American citizens coming through, Ukrainians coming through. 
We knew every parking lot, every hotel, even every veterinarian in the border area, border area because when refugees move, they sometimes bring their pets. And when we, we were ready for game time, we expected the thousands to come in from Ukraine into Poland. What we did not expect were the thousands of Poles rushing to the border in their cars, on trains, getting to the border after organizing on social media with, say, the Adamiuk family. I'm making this up now, but the Adamiuk family coming across the Medica border crossing, or another Ukrainian family coming across the Korchova border crossing to take them to an apartment being funded by a GoFundMe page or to one of their homes in Białystok or in Bydgoszcz or in Poznan or in Krakow to host them, maybe for a, for a month, maybe two months was their plans. And now 14, 15 months into this conflict, many, many of the, these Ukrainians' families are still there, still being hosted by the people of Poland. And they are here in the millions. When I go into any Zabka, which is like the 7-Eleven of Poland, Zabka is like, it's a store with a little frog. Zabka means little frog. And so you see all these Zabka stores all around Poland. You hear Ukrainian language. In fact, the Zabka stores, there's 9,000 Zabka stores in Poland. The Zabka stores in the eastern part of Poland have as a rule that if a Ukrainian refugee walks in and they have no money, they, they should take what they want and they should leave. I mean, imagine that as a greeting to refugees. And I want to share with my, my, my fellow UVA you know, students as a grad, um, the formulation, three words, the formulation in Polish that I think is the metaphor to the Polish response to this crisis that so contributes to the American interest because these refugees would have to be housed and sheltered and taken care of somewhere, somewhere in Europe, somewhere in North America or elsewhere. There's a town just across the Ukrainian border in Poland called Przemysl. And it's one of the first arriving places for refugees arriving in from Ukraine. Millions of people have gone through Przemysl. At the railroad station in Przemysl, there is a huge banner, a huge banner that hangs over the railroad station. And it reads, Tutaj jesteście bezpiecznie. Tutaj jesteście bezpiecznie. It means here you are safe. And I ask you, who in the world does not want to be safe? And especially a refugee arriving with a couple of kids, who, who more than them needs to feel safe? When I've gone to the border and I've seen primarily women and children coming across the border because the men stay in Ukraine to do the fight. I've, I've gone up to some of them and I've talked with them. I remember going up to a Ukrainian women with two sons. I think they were roughly eight years old and 11 years old. And I asked them how long they had been waiting. And this was last March. I asked them how long they'd been waiting at the border. And, I, and they said, four days. And all I could say was, yes, I'm proud of you. Because you can't give anything to someone who's made that kind of sacrifice. It is amazing the peril and the trouble that the Ukrainians have gone through to get to Poland and the welcome the Polish people have provided. This rapid mobilization is truly a national asset. You know, every country has a balance sheet. It, it, every country has a balance sheet of assets and liabilities. Assets can be, you know, economic innovation. It can be, a, a liability can be political gridlock. And I can report to you that one of the assets of Poland is rapid mobilization and reactive mobilization. It's been seen here in history during World War II, during the Warsaw Uprising, when young people fought against the Nazi occupation and organized 
in, in, in absolutely heroic undertakings. It was seen during the Solidarity Era, which produced effective change in a nonviolent way. And it is seen now in 2023, this massive reactive mobilization of opening homes and apartments and giving the Ukrainian refugees who are here every single legal right a Polish citizen has, the right to go to school, the right to work, the right for medical care, state-sponsored state medical care, that a Polish citizen has except the right to vote. And there's a huge formal and informal supply chain from Poland into Ukraine to support the Ukrainian people as they do the fight against the Russian attackers. 80%, 80% of all the supplies reaching the Ukrainian people, military and non-military, come through Poland. That could not be lost on Putin. That could not be okay with Putin. And that's the risk the Polish people are taking. And the rapid mobilization they have underway, if I were to, com as, as, if I were to compare it to what we've seen in American history, the way I would compare it to is the rapid mobilization after the attack on Pearl Harbor, making a war arsenal into a, rea a reality across two oceans, and the rapid mobilization that occurred after President John F. Kennedy called for America to win the race to the moon, which produced massive technological innovation. So it's an amazing moment to be here in Poland. I have an absolutely phenomenal team of over 600 uh, team members at US Embassy uh, Warsaw. Um, but the reactive here gives hope to great national renewal, um, I must say. And I am so pleased to report this to you at UVA because I got my start in terms of my focus on Poland at UVA. When I was at the University of Virginia Law School is when I first really developed an interest in Poland. And for the Virginia Law Review, I wrote an article on Poland's long-term constitutional heritage, the collision between that heritage and totalitarianism, and what could be various forms of constitutional renewal in post-communist Poland. I published it in the Virginia Law Review. Professors David Martin and Dick Howard were essential um, mentors to me. And following that, I did a Fulbright scholarship at the Polish Constitutional Court, where I wrote a book about constitutional renewal in Poland. And so meeting you today is coming full circle to Charlottesville. I'm so grateful I had a chance to have those experience more than 30 years ago, because learning Poland from the street, learning Polish language helps me now so much as U.S. ambassador, as I try to deliver for you every single minute of every single day, the American people. So Steve, why don't I stop there and take any questions you have or anyone else has. A warm welcome to you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, Mark, it's, it's really wonderful to be with you. I know how jam-packed your schedule is that you would take uh, this much time to be with us and visit with us is, is so widely appreciated here. And I especially appreciate it because I know from personal experience, you have one of the best jobs in American diplomacy in the world. And that's especially true uh, today. And thanks on behalf of all of your friends and admirers back here for the great job that you're, you're doing. Now, you arrived in uh, Poland uh, just before the war began, uh, just over, over a year ago. We're not saying that you were responsible for it in any way, but the truth is you've had Thank a you. front row seat uh, for these dramatic developments of the past year uh, with the dramatic Ukrainian resistance against the Russian attempt to seize Kyiv, uh, to its dramatic, the Ukrainian forces' dramatic uh, return to their sovereignty and parts of, of Kherson. But over the course of this war so far, it seems to have settled into a very bloody uh, and difficult stalemate. Russia now has about 17% of Ukraine's territory, it was about 7% um, after their first invasion back in 2014. Um, how, do you, how do you see the situation on the ground there from the, uh, the front row seat? Uh, there was talk of a, an imminent uh, spring uh, offensive. Uh, how do you see the conflict playing out in the coming months? Sure. Well, 
Steve, from here, from Poland, I will say the Ukrainian people have produced a heroic and successful fight that many people here did not expect. Many people actually expected uh, Putin's military to roll through Ukraine in just a couple of days. And the story of Ukrainian resistance, truly for the people in Central Europe, is reminiscent of the resistance put forward during World War II. And I think that's an important historical context because for many people in Central Europe, one important reason why they will do anything to support the Ukrainians is because this is 1939. This is Central Europe being attacked by a vicious foreign oppressor. And yet this is a moment when the Poles, the Romanians, the Slovaks, others are able to do something about it, whether it's to provide security, whether it's to host refugees or in other ways. In terms of the tactics that, that have evolved over the last year, it's important to remember that collectively, the West has a strategy that it is implementing, not individual countries. And it has been really a mark of understanding the nuances of it that President Biden has led a 50-country coalition with different resources and different perspectives on this conflict and maintaining a unity of purpose and a shared definition of the strategy and a shared definition of the challenge is what he has managed to execute in countries that are similar to Poland's outlook on the, on the fight in Ukraine and also very different of it. Tactically, the support, you'll, you'll know this just as well, Steve, has evolved initially. We were providing javelins to the Ukrainian people at the beginning of the war. And then the Russians began pulverizing Ukrainian cities. So we provided HIMARS, which are these multi-missile multi, um, systems that can kind of really go after an 18, 20 acre area of when, when, it, when it fires on an area. And now, the, now what is being conveyed is tanks. This has all been in reaction as Russia itself has changed its tactics. I think that it's really important to remember that all this is being spearheaded on the Russian side by Putin. And Putin is not a politician like Yeltsin or Gorbachev looking to cut a deal or to find a compromise. He tragically has, I think, resolve on this. He is a KGB officer who is a son of a KGB officer. He comes from that culture. And so while we hope the conflict ends today, we are level setting with everyone, the Ukrainians, the Poles, and everyone else, that this is likely to be a long, drawn out conflict. We'll see what happens this summer. We'll see what works in terms of dislodging Russian forces. Um, and, um, but the expectation is that this will last. On the flip side, it has become very clear that the Russians understand that we mean it when we do not want this conflict to expand, that we will protect every square inch of NATO territory, which of course includes Poland. So as I speak to you, there's over 10,000 American soldiers in Poland. I mean, imagine that, over 10,000 American soldiers in Poland spread out mostly all across Polish bases, although for the first time in history, we now have a permanent U.S. Army headquarters, Fifth Corps headquarters in Poznan, Poland, to align command and control, um, synchronicity and interoperability in terms of tactics. Um, and uh, that is an important tactical and symbolic uh, step vis-a-vis -vis Poland to have that first permanent um, footprint here. And the bottom line is, is that we are ready for any contingency and we're ready for every contingency. And we're very much synced up with the Poles militarily and politically. And I think the best example of that is 
what happened in Przewodów in eastern Poland in November when two Polish citizens um, in a rural part in eastern Poland were killed by an errant missile that came in from Ukraine. Um, but initially, no one knew where that missile came from. And there was some speculation that it had come from Russia, which was not the case. But people were worried that um, this was a Russian attack on NATO soil that had resulted in, in fatalities of Polish citizens. And Poland, of course, is a member of NATO. And the syncing up immediately of our president, President Biden, with the Polish president, while President Biden was in Asia for a conference, our national security advisor, our secretary of state was instantaneous. No one ran to the, um, to, to the, to the media pool spray to do press conferences about what had happened without knowing what had happened. The first step was to sync together Poland and America to figure out what had happened, to share a strategy on how to message to our respective peoples what had happened, and then to coordinate for a joint approach in NATO the next day. And it was, you can always plan, we at the embassy had planned literally around the question, Steve, of what would happen if an errant missile came in from Ukraine and killed some Polish citizens. We had planned that last summer and last fall. And here we were on a Tuesday night in November and that had exactly happened, but you never know what will happen when you exercise on the actual, you know, on game day. And I'm, 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 I'm pleased to report that was, there was tremendous discipline on all sides and we were able to manage that crisis and uh, nothing became chaotic. And so I feel that we have solidarity to coin a phrase here in Poland to address this crisis with the view that this crisis probably will drag on, although we hope it ends sooner. Right. Um, you know, one of the one of the pieces of, of breaking news this week on the Ukraine war uh, was the telephone call from Chinese leader Xi Jinping uh, to President Zelensky, uh, which lasted by all reports uh, quite long and both sides described it as quite constructive. And immediately after that, Xi announced uh, he's sending veteran Chinese diplomat uh, Louis Hui uh, on a mission to uh, Ukraine to explore peace talks. And Zelensky announced that he is now sending a, an ambassador to, to Beijing. Uh, what's the view there in Poland about the prospects for a diplomatic solution? Uh, do, you, uh, do the Poles welcome uh, the role of, of, of China in trying to broker a deal uh, like this? Uh, or are they really focused in supporting, providing the kind of solid military support that, that we and, and our Polish friends and other allies have uh, been concentrating on? Well, you know, the United States has been encouraging President Xi to speak with President Zelensky, to hear directly from President Zelensky what he faces, how this has destabilized a important central part of Eurasia. Um, and that couldn't also that couldn't be good for the Chinese in terms of Chinese interests. There is a role for China and other countries in supporting a diplomatic outcome here. And Secretary Blinken, President Biden have been consistent and clear to this moment that there exists a diplomatic off ramp for Russia to take. And it would make so much sense for the Russians to take that diplomatic off ramp. What on earth strategically is Putin or is Russia gaining from this? You know, um, and, uh, and at the same time, when it comes to a diplomatic outcome, nothing is gonna be decided about Ukraine without Ukraine. And so Zelensky's voice, um, the perspective on what would be a fair and just outcome will govern here as well. But you know, to, to have the Chinese listen and learn to connect with top Ukrainian leaders is possibly part of a way forward diplomatically. We, the Americans, certainly are keeping our fingers crossed. In Poland, no question, the country wants to see peace in the East. This country, more than most, has borne the burden of the crisis with 
you know, there's a real cost to hosting in people's homes and apartments millions of refugees. And the way our system, the U.S. government system works, is that we cannot provide directly assistance to Polish families hosting a Ukrainian family. So this is a diffuse, a diffuse form of humanitarian assistance that the Poles are providing. I feel that we're doing our part. We've done $35 billion worth of military assistance to the Ukrainians, and we, are, we have boots on the ground here in Poland. But it is a huge lift that the Poles have underway. I think it's also important to kind of provide a sense of historical direction in all this, Steve, and this is what I mean, that in the long term, if the Ukrainians do win, and I do think that they will win, if the Ukrainians do win, that will be the single biggest endorsement of political democracy and free market economy in 100 years. Uh, it will be such a catalytic moment. And there are transformational qualities aligned with that. And there would be an opportunity to rebuild Ukraine and transform Ukraine and to orient Ukraine more with the West that would behoove the entire region. And already you see people developing a posture here in Poland and elsewhere to be able to do that. There's tremendous modernization here of energy infrastructure, of cyber in infrastructure. There is a, a kind of generational moment here where I was in Radom, Poland yesterday, meeting at, with the Pulaski University there. And the enthusiasm of Polish young people about what they have done and about how they have introduced themselves to the world as people who walk the walk in terms of humanitarian relief has itself important consequences for the outlook and the political opportunity of the country. And so there's also a kind of a, a, a optimistic, positive dimension to the direction that this could all go here. But the Ukrainians have to win. Yeah, the uh, stress of this is, is just almost unimaginable. I, I saw it myself when I was in, uh, in Poland last time we were together uh, last May. And uh, just seeing firsthand the number of refugees uh, on the streets of Warsaw and the warm welcome and support that they were, were getting. And then here in the rest of the West, uh, one of the enormous achievements that I think has surprised a lot of people was the swiftness uh, and the strength of the unity that the United States and its NATO allies were, were, have been able to maintain in supporting the Ukrainians and standing up against the Russians, the Europeans taking dramatic steps to wean themselves off of Russian energy supply. But as time has gone on here in the United States, as you know, there have been voices on the margin saying, this isn't our war, this isn't our business, uh, we should be doing other things. But that, that really has remained on the margins. The degree of bipartisan support for the strength of the U.S. response is, is still pretty strong more than a year later. How does it look in Poland? Are people getting tired? Are there beginning to be, is there beginning to be uh, complaints about the, the costs and the stress of this? Well, first of all, um, uh, let me kind of address several parts of what, what you just talked about. Um, the, 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 the challenges of having refugees in, in, in people's homes here in Poland, there are some very kind of reality-based challenges. When a family you don't know lives in your home for a year, things happen. People stop talking to each other. People get into an argument over who, who uses the kitchen, and yet they keep on going. So there is a quality about this that drains energy and takes persistence, and yet we're continuing to see that happen. I can tell you, Steve, that I have really assiduously tried to collect information about the capacity of the Polish people to keep doing this. Because if they can't keep doing this, it's important for us to know that ahead of time. And both public opinion polling and anecdotal just kind of interviews or meetings with Poles all across the country, including in Radom yesterday, but everywhere I go in Poland, and I've been all over Poland asking this question, 
How much longer can you keep on doing this? How much can, longer can you keep doing truck deliveries deep into Ukraine? How much longer, doctor, can you and your team continuing, continue to provide free medical care to Ukrainians coming in you know, with, with war trauma? How, how much longer can you keep hosting these families in your homes? And amazingly, amazingly, the, the, the response is almost universally, as long as it takes, as long as we have to. These are our neighbors. And if they fall apart, we're next. So that's what's driving that. But it's more important than my anecdotal reports is the Pew public opinion polling on Poland. Pew is an authoritative polling platform, and they did a poll of, of, of polls, excuse me, um, asking, do you welcome refugees anymore? Uh, and a full 80% plus of respondents said, not, not only do we welcome refugees, we welcome more refugees, which I thought was just an incredible incredible statement because you have to remember that the embrace of refugees in Poland is a product of national policy. Literally, the president of the country, President Duda, has gone onto national television and said, we must welcome the Ukrainian refugees and we must welcome them into our homes. And thank you for continuing to do that. Um, and that's why it's important for the rest of the world, not just the United States, but for the rest of the world to recognize that what's happening in Ukraine is not just a Ukrainian or Polish problem. It's not just also an American problem. It's an international problem. And it's important for others to share in and join in, in this. And there, there were um, a uh, very regularly um, commute, what is called a, a, uh, a daily community of interest meeting down in Jeshov in southeastern Poland, of all the different regional, city, military, national government, and international diplomatic representations in Poland meeting regularly at the G2 arena to mix and match resources being provided at the border. And it was so awesome for me to see the Japanese, the Australians, the Koreans, the Swiss, countries that are not close to to the border, and here they all are. And I think ultimately that will be, that will have to be the response of supporting the crisis in Ukraine and the refugees from Ukraine. I will say this though, that um, the number of US officials coming to Poland to bear witness is pretty unprecedented in my experience at least. Um, when I was US ambassador to Sweden over four years, I think in total, I welcomed six members of Congress coming through Stockholm. Since February, 2022, US Mission Poland has hosted over 140 members of Congress. And then to add to that, we've had President Biden here twice within the last year, Vice President Kamala Harris, the Secretary of State three times, Secretary of Defense three times, uh, National Security Advisor, Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, almost half the cabinet. And that's such a, an important piece of bearing witness because for publicly elected officials to then be able to return to America to say, what is at stake here is the possibility of a crisis getting much, much, much worse and much, much more expensive, but for the actions of our allies, in this case, the Poles, the Baltic states, the Romanians, the Slovaks, each doing what they can to address this crisis right here on the front line. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about the impact of the war uh, and all of this heightened bilateral engagement that you just described? What's been the overall impact on US-Polish relations? As, as you and I both know well, Poland has just been a remarkable and, and reliable ally since the end of communism more than 30 years ago. Uh, they stepped up and helped us in our wars in Afghanistan and Iraq without even taking a second to think, think about it. They've been great partners in building a European security architecture, a missile defense architecture and so forth. But, you know, 
even as even in the best of relationships, there are occasional disagreements from the Polish side. Traditionally, there's been concern uh, up until recently that we gave too much uh, consideration to the Russian point of view in approaching European security. Uh, we were too slow to reposition uh, military forces to the eastern frontier of NATO, which we've now uh, corrected. And of course, the longstanding visa irritant, which I spent a lot of time dealing with. And that fortunately for you, our, our colleague, uh, George Mosbacher fixed, uh, oh. uh, fixed that. And of course, from our side, there's been uh, occasional concerns about rule of law, uh, independence of the judiciary, press freedom, and, and issues of, of women's rights and, uh, and sexual sure. minorities. So as, as the Ukraine war made those problems diminish or, 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 or disappear, what, what's been the overall impact of the war on our relations? Well, thank you for that question, because I think this is such an important message to all the students listening who, who are going to pursue a career in diplomacy or in government or in negotiations and so forth. And it's, it's like what my ambassador school classmate, US ambassador to, to Japan, Rahm Emanuel always says, never miss a chance to seize opportunity from a crisis. And the fact is, Steve, that, you know, well, first of all, you, Georgette Mossbacher, were transformational ambassadors here. You set the tone, in terms of the military construct between America and Poland that made it safer, or, and that set the tone in terms of the people-people construct that made it closer uh, with, the, with the inclusion of the visa waiver program of Poland. And we are all beneficiaries of that in a huge way. We would be very much set back right now if we didn't have those. But the fact is, is that probably a year and a half ago, Steve, the government here is center right, the Duda government, the Biden administration is center left. And there was, there was not as close and almost a little bit of a drifting quality to the relationship. And what the crisis has done is that it's meshed us together like never before. Never before have we had the military collaboration because we've never had over 10,000 troops here and HIMARS and Patriot systems and F-35s and F-15s and, you know, huge defense purchases by Poland of Apaches and, a, and Patriot systems and weapon system that bring huge number of, of American soldiers and American defense contractors here teaching how to use these, uh, these, these, these particular weapons. Um, we also have a remarkable business to business moment here, despite the fact that Poland is on the edge of a war zone, precisely, excuse me, um, because the Polish people are, are presenting a resilience and a presenting an innovative and improvisational quality that tech firms and light industry and manufacturing very much want to see. And so despite the fact that we're close to a war zone, we're seeing American business investment we're seeing with Google just purchased the Warsaw Hub, two buildings here in Warsaw for $1 billion. And then they also did $38 million for Ukrainian refugees. Susan Wojcicki, CEO of YouTube, I, just, I hosted her here a few months ago. She announced thousands of Polish jobs for, uh, for, for YouTube here. Uh, Chris Kamczynski, the CEO of McDonald's. Um, they, McDonald's now has 512 stores here and continues to grow and plans a major multi-million dollar investment that will create thousands and thousands, 12,000 more jobs in Poland. So it's not like business is going away from Poland, business is coming to Poland in the course of a crisis. And so there's a meshing together, even on some things where we are both countries are working assiduously on in our own ways, democracy, rule of law, human rights, and freedom. You know, President Biden, when he was at the at, in, in, in the square in front of the Royal Castle here said, the United States is working on its own challenges with regard to democracy and Poland is as well. And what I have found is that our alignment in terms of security and business very much synchronizes with our goals here in terms of rule of law and democracy 
and human rights. Just by way of example, um, there were questions about whether or not the, uh, the news channel TVN24 would get their license renewed. And I'm pleased to report that it's been renewed twice. We've had somewhat nationalistic laws pertaining to education vetoed. We've had laws submitted to the parliament pertaining to some aspects of the judiciary that, that we thought were not consistent with the rule of law submitted by the president's office. And so while certainly not perfect, we certainly have a robust and results-oriented dialogue with the polls underway. And these things are interdependent with each other. I really feel that we wouldn't be making the amount of progress we're making on democracy, rule of law, and human rights, but for our work together on security and business and in other ways. One thing that was very much important to me when I came to Poland and when I was going through Senate confirmation, Steve, and what I said before the US Senate during confirmation, when asked about threats, especially to the LGBTQI community in Poland, I said three words, America embraces equality. And on that, we are not going to give any ground. And I will say that in the course of the past year, we did a number of pride events and pursued a number of different initiatives vis-a-vis -vis the Polish government that involved almost 40 other countries through the diplomatic war here. And while my predecessor, Georgette, received some criticism when she valiantly and heroically pursued the same agenda, I have not received as much, I think perhaps in part because of the crisis pertaining to the war, that we have enough fish to fry in terms of joint work together. Let's not create more problems. I think that may be the perspective of people yeah. who otherwise might have created problems. I don't know, I can't speak for them, but I can tell you we have an extremely robust agenda underway, have had that and will have that. And we're very direct about it. And um, uh, I, as ambassador, feel extremely comfortable presenting that agenda to any audience in Poland. And that was not something that I expected when I initially came out here, you know, 16 months ago. Mm -hmm. oh, that's ter terrific. Uh, before we turn uh, to some of our students' questions, uh, one other question I wanted to ask you, uh, more on a personal level, what's, what's been the impact of this war on you and your team at, at the embassy? Uh, can you talk about what your jobs have been like over the past year, your, what it's like every day there to be doing this job? What kinds of things are they, are you and they doing? Sure. Well, the, you know, what I planned to do in Poland when I was in ambassador school dramatically changed because of the war. <laughs> and so, but in certain ways, it goes to what I said earlier, which is never miss the chance to seize opportunity out of a crisis. And that's what I and every team member at U.S. at U.S. Mission Poland has done. Um, it was imperative in the lead up to the war. So I would say four things in response to your question. In the lead up to the war, I don't. I have never participated in an intelligence sharing in a level setting with a foreign country like we did with Poland to share with them of course, at the direction of the U.S. president, in U.S. intelligence that very much clarified what are the defensive and offensive structures of the Russian military and what does the Russian political elite intend to do with it in Ukraine. And at first, some Polish officials didn't really even believe that this was going to happen. And the fact that we were able to share what we knew and to prepare, which means getting a scientific understanding of that part of Poland where all this would occur was imperative. I have to tell you, Steve, I never thought I would spend as much time in Jeshuf and Przemysl in, in Podkarpaty, which is the region of Poland where all this is going on in eastern Poland near the Ukraine border, as I have. <laughs> I thought I would be going to Krakow a lot more. I thought I'd be going to Poznan a lot more or Gdańsk. No, I have been going to of course, to Zeshev, where the 82nd Airborne 
was deployed. Now we have the 10th Mountain Division deployed, all organized down there, uh, at first in the G2 arena. Um, and uh, we were able to develop, as I said before, and this is for everyone on the call, whether you're intending to go into diplomacy or not, whether you're in business or in running an NGO, crisis management is all about preparation and developing a hugely practical understanding of what are the realities of where this crisis is going to go down. And our knowledge initially of the eight border crossings between Poland and Ukraine was not as strong as it, as it was on game day, February 24, 2022, when the crisis broke out. And we were ready. We were ready in every possible way. And in fact, even expected more American citizens to come across than did. But we had welcome centers run by the State Department. We had all the security dimensions and security ramparts that you can think of. And that's a team effort. That's the US Embassy you know, leaving their family here in Warsaw and going to live for three months in Jeshuv, which is four hours away by car. Um, it's about the US military flying Blackhawks from Warsaw Airport to Jeshuv and getting all that level set and joining up with Polish pilots and this type of thing. There's a tremendous amount of synchronization that you have to literally walk the walk uh, to manage. And so I hadn't been expecting in my first year to be getting all around Poland and doing meet and greets in various cities in the north and the west and so forth. Well, I think I know everyone between Warsaw and Jeshub, <laughs> but the rest of Poland I still have to get to. Um, and I have done a little bit, but not as much as I, as I want to. Um, it has been stressful at times because you're close to a war zone. We don't know what kind of hybrid war Russia would pursue. Thankfully, we've developed a confidence in the Polish security services that really lends to the conclusion that we've got this in terms of kind of sneaky hybrid things that the Russians can do around here. Um, and uh, I'm very happy about that. And the American community, which is large, because there's a large Polish American community, of course, the American community in Poland, I feel, I, I feel feels safe here and confident that this combination of America and Poland has got this. And the last thing I'll say is I'm extremely thankful for two things that I had done before coming to Poland as U.S. ambassador. A, I'd been an ambassador before at a smaller mission, U.S. Embassy Stockholm, 200 people versus 600, and that I'd done a Fulbright in Poland, and that I did a paper at UVA on Poland's constitutional heritage and renewal. I'm so thankful for that because it gave me, every, you know, it gave me knowledge that I deploy every single day here. And so if there's anything that, you know, whatever, quote, wisdom, end quote, that I can try to share with UVA students is make no mistake, the papers and projects and things that you do to learn as a student, it pays back hugely down the road in ways that you will never expect it. I never expected my paper for the Virginia Law Review to help me so much in this mission here in Poland. So thankful that UVA gave me that opportunity. Thankful to the law school and to professors Martin and Howard for believing in me and giving me a chance. Uh, it helped me and, and set the trajectory for a career. And being here in Poland with Polish roots is kind of like a wonderful personal thing for, for, uh, for me. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's great advice as we're moving into final season here. So that will inspire right. people to work uh, harder for their finals, uh, yeah. uh, final exams. Uh, I have a question for you from uh, Mateusz Kudra, who's a first-generation Polish-American undergraduate here in his fourth year. And he was wondering that as the United States uh, enters into a more adversarial relationship with China, uh, is America going to remain committed to Europe, uh, he assumes that the United States would not want to divide its resources between two, two different theaters. So if America is going to remain committed, how, how will we do so? Well, I, that's a great question, Mateusz. And I will say that I think the American-European relationship is really, really being renewed through this crisis because we're working together against against a clearly 
bad adversary. What Russia is doing in Ukraine, the video from Ukraine is reminiscent of World War II. It literally is. Children being bust away, torture, executions, and so forth. And the West is carefully and thoughtfully doing something about it. And there is a, I feel, innovative renaissance to the American-European relationship that foreign policy thinkers, I don't think, have begun to really yet write about and talk about it. But there is a renewal there that is profoundly impact, impactful because it's working. And success breeds success in life and certainly in diplomacy. And we have a successful moment here, led by a president, President Joe Biden, who has spent decades and decades getting to know the issues, getting to know the peoples, getting to know the countries, and he has guts. The fact that the president in February went to Kiev, Ukraine, for the first time in modern American history, at least, a U.S. president went to a war zone where there is no U.S. military installation. There's no U.S. military installation in Ukraine. And he did it because he wanted to bear witness in Kiev. And then he came to Warsaw and he told the world about what he had seen and about what is at stake. And what I'm seeing in business, in industry, in finance, in engineering is a renaissance despite this crisis here and probably also in a weird way because of this crisis. Uh, in many ways, the Polish tech industry is receiving a huge jolt because so many Ukrainian coders and tech innovators and people who ran startups in Ukraine tragically had to move, but they're bringing their knowledge and their ability to Poland. Um, the, the, uh, I recently ran a roundtable here at the residence around the prospect of Ukraine rebuilding and transformation, the role of Poland. And one of the people at that roundtable is the CEO of Poland's major construction company. You would know it, Steve, Budimex. And Budimex uh, has about 50,000 employees, at least one quarter, if not one third of whom are Ukrainian. And so they are poised to engage in a rebuilding and transformation process in Ukraine the moment that they can get started. And so there's a possibility here in this part of the world of a tremendously impactful economic event, the rebuilding of Ukraine, which could approach $1 trillion because this is infrastructure and contracting at European prices that could also have tremendous dynamic qualities pertaining to politics, rights, generational issues, gender equality. I just hosted an event here right before I walked into my meeting with you all on gender equality and entrepreneurship here. And there's a, dyna a dynamism pertaining to uh, women in business leadership, gender equality in Poland that I think is exactly what Poland needs. And so what I'm trying to say is that this is not a static time in Warsaw or in Poland. This is a hopping time. Um, and I am hopeful and optimistic that it can produce great results that will remain very attractive to the American people and so, no, as we take on the challenge from China, I do not think that Europe will be forgotten. And it's precisely because of this crisis that I think that this is actually a special, impactful, hopeful moment in American-European relations. Thanks, uh, Mark. Uh, let me give you, uh, you can indulge just a few more seconds, one final question and an appropriate one from Kiona Vega, a first year student here, who notes the great relationship between the US and Poland. She wonders, why is it important for us to have a relationship with Poland? Well, uh, Kiona, thank you so much for that question. The answer to that question is the following. The challenges that our world faces, whether it's climate change or economic challenges or the threat of terrorism, it's not in our self-interest, it's not in the American interest for those challenges to be only ours. Others should share in and join in solving them. Others should share in and join in paying for them. And 
That is what diplomacy is all about. Diplomacy is about the multiplier effect. The multiplier effect of the Poles housing millions of refugees who otherwise would have to go elsewhere into Western Europe, into America. It's about the challenge of security, of the Poles realistically being able to provide a security context and a defensive context that offsets the threat of a Russian military invasion. That's the role of the American military here, frankly speaking. The Russian military fears the American military. And I'm so happy that it does because Poland is safe because of it. And so this multiplier effect helps us all. It makes it more efficient for each of us as American citizens and as citizens of the world. And so I hope, Keone, that you take that very thoughtful question about what is in, what is in it for us and deploy it in your career. Because the answer to that question uh, is that there's a lot. There's a lot at stake for us to get diplomacy right. Steve and his career delivered so much for the American interest. We're doing our best for you here at uh, US Mission Poland. And to all UVA, Vitami Vapolse, welcome to Poland. Well, thank you so much, Ambassador Brzezinski and um, Ambassador Mull. It's been such an engaging time we've had together. And uh, I hope you do take the opportunity when you have a chance to come back here to UVA. We would love to, to meet with you in person. But I just want to thank uh, today, of course, the uh, Global Affairs here at UVA, Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, and the European Studies Program. And I also want to thank the UVA students out there who, who have chosen to give us a little bit of their time. It's such an honor to host a, a Wahoo, and especially one who is so motivated and excited to share his experience. Just want to thank you. Thank you all. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much.